preface and chapter one of dr quintard chaplain c s a and second bishop of tennessee this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales dr quintard chaplain c s a and second bishop of tennessee by charles todd quintard preface and chapter one introduction preface the chapters of this volume containing the memoirs of the war were written by bishop quintard about the year eighteen ninety six and are to be read with that date in mind the work of the editor thereon has been devoted to bringing them into conformity with a plan agreed upon in personal interviews with bishop quintard about that time in the first and in the last two chapters of the book the editor has drawn freely even to the extent of transcribing entire sentences and paragraphs upon the bishop's own addresses in the diocesan journals of tennessee upon memorial addresses by his successor the right rev dr gaylor upon material used in some of the chapters of the editor's history of the church in the diocese of tennessee and upon documents preserved in the archives of the university of the south thanks are due to the rev bartow b ramage the rev roland hale and mr george e purvis among others for valuable assistance in the original preparation of the memoirs a h n sewanee tennessee may nineteen o five chapter one introduction writers upon the late civil war have never done full justice to the high religious character of the majority of those who compose the confederate government and its army and the high religious principles which inspired them not only was the conviction of conscience clear in the southern soldiers that they were right in waging war against the federal government but the people of the south looked upon their cause as a holy one and their conduct of affairs civil and military was wholly in accord with such a view the confederacy as it came into existence committed its civil affairs by deliberate choice to men not only of approved morality but of approved religious character as well it was not merely by accident that in the organization of its army choice was made of such men as robert e lee and thomas j jackson not to mention a large number of other christian soldiers as leaders and it seemed in no way incongruous in the conduct of a war of such a character that commissions were offered to and accepted by the rev william nelson pendleton rector of grace church lexington virginia and the right rev leonidas polk d d bishop of louisiana a religious tone pervades the state papers pertaining to the confederacy its proclamations and its legislation the same religious tone is conspicuous in a majority of the military leaders it is found upon investigation to have impressed itself upon the officers of regiments and companies and upon the private soldiers in the ranks throughout the whole army so that there is more than an ordinary basis for the statement surprising as such statement may appear at first that the armies of the confederate states had in them a larger proportion than any other in history since those of cromwell's nicknamed roundheads of true and active christian men the provision made for the spiritual needs of the men in the field was quite remarkable in the great haste with which the army of the confederacy was organized equipped and sent to the field there might have been found abundant apology for the omission of chaplains from the official staffs yet there was no need for seeking such an apology for the chaplains were not overlooked even imputing a love of excitement and adventure to the young men who composed in such large measure the fighting forces of the confederacy at the first they did not neglect to secure the services of a chaplain for each regiment which went to the seat of war it was naturally thought that work might be found for chaplains in the hospitals but it was early discovered that a chaplain had opportunities for efficient work at all times in the midst of active campaigns and when the army was in winter quarters nor was their work in vain few religious services in times of peace equalled in attendance in fervor or results those held at or in the immediate vicinity of encampments of the confederate army 
the camps of regiments which had been sent forth with prayer and benediction were often the seats of earnest religious life it is estimated that fifteen thousand men in the army of virginia alone made some open and public profession of their allegiance to christ during the war and were affected in their subsequent lives by religious experiences gained in the war and the number is especially remarkable of men in the southern army who after the close of the war entered the sacred ministry and won distinction in their holy calling a study of what might be called the religious phases of this war history should be approached through a consideration of the chaplains of the confederacy they were a regimental institution and their number might be determined by the number of regiments engaged in the war they were for the most part men of brains of a keen sense of humour and of fidelity to what they regarded as their duty sticking to their posts maintaining the most friendly and intimate relations with the boys ever on the lookout for opportunities to do good in any way ready to give up their horses to some poor fellows with bare and blistered feet and to march in the column as it hurried forward going on picket duty with their men and bivouacking with them in the pelting storm sharing with them at all times their hardships and their dangers gaining a remarkably wide experience during four years of army life and probably with it all acquiring the pleasing art of the raconteur if an individual were desired for a more particular illustration of the religious phases of confederate war history he might be found in the rev charles todd quintod m d of the first tennessee regiment and after the war second bishop of tennessee he not only fully conformed to the type above indicated but in some respects he surpassed it for his knowledge of the healing art and his surgical skill were ever at the demands of his fellow-soldiers he was one of the earliest to enter the service of the confederate army and was probably the most widely known and the best beloved of all the chaplains dr quintard was born in stamford connecticut on the twenty second of december eighteen twenty four his ancestors were huguenots who left france after the revocation of the edict of nantes and settled the country north of manhattan island between long island sound and the hudson river those who knew dr quintard at any period of his life had no difficulty in detecting his french ancestry in his personal appearance as well as in his manner his vivacity and demonstrativeness though not a few who failed to get well acquainted with him fell into the error of supposing that some of his mannerisms were an affectation acquired in some of his visits to england subsequent to the war his father was isaac quintard a man of wealth and education a prominent citizen of stamford having been born in the same house in which he gave his son a birthplace and in which he died in eighteen eighty three in the ninetieth year of his age the doctor was a pupil at trinity school new york city and took his master's degree at columbia college he studied medicine with dr james r wood and dr valentine mott and was graduated with the degree of doctor of medicine at the university of the city of new york in eighteen forty seven after a year at bellevue hospital he removed to georgia and began the practice of medicine at athens in that state where he was a parishioner of the rev william bacon stevens afterwards bishop of pennsylvania in eighteen fifty one he accepted the chair of physiology and pathological anatomy in the medical college of memphis tennessee and became in that city co-editor with dr ayres p merrill of the memphis medical recorder there also he formed a close friendship with bishop oti and in january eighteen fifty four he was admitted a candidate for holy orders that year he appeared in the twenty sixth annual convention of the church in the diocese of tennessee held in st john's church knoxville as the lay representative of st paul's church randolph st paul's church has since passed out of existence and the town of randolph no longer appears upon the map of the state of tennessee studying theology under the direction of his bishop he was ordered deacon in calvary church memphis in january eighteen fifty five and a year later was advanced to the priesthood 
his diaconate was spent in missionary work in tipton county one of the mississippi river counties of tennessee upon his advancement to the priesthood he became rector of calvary church memphis in the latter part of eighteen fifty six he resigned the rectorship of his memphis parish and at the urgent request of bishop oti accepted the rectorship of the church of the advent nashville he had charge also of the church of the holy trinity in that city and extended his work to edgefield now east nashville and to the parish of st anne he served the diocese as a member of the standing committee and as a clerical deputy to the general convention meeting in richmond virginia in the fall of eighteen fifty nine he was a man of varied and deep learning a preacher of power and attractiveness and ranked among the clergymen of greatest prominence and popularity in nashville he was of ardent temperament affectionate disposition and possessed personal magnetism to a remarkable degree especially with young men who looked up to him with an affection which is now rarely if ever shown by young men to the ministry this and the influence he had over young men are illustrated by the organization in eighteen fifty nine of the rock city guard a militia company composed largely of the young men of nashville dr quintard was at once elected chaplain of that organization and his first public parade was for the purpose of attending services in a body at the church of the advent at which he officiated his was a churchmanship of a type in those days considerably in advance of the average in the antebellum period in the south he was clearly under the spell of the oxford movement and of the english tractarians and occupied a position to which churchmen generally in this country did not approach until ten or twenty years later he was a sacerdotalist a pronounced sacramentarian at times when the highest high churchmen of the country would have hesitated long before applying those terms to themselves to him baptism was not a theory and a notion but a gift and a power and baptized children were to be educated not with a view to their becoming christians but because they were already christians consequently he regarded confirmation not as joining the church or as merely a ratifying and renewing of the vows and promises of holy baptism and hence as something which man does for god but as something which god does for man the bestowal of the gift of the holy spirit to the preparation of candidates for confirmation he therefore gave his most earnest attention even to the extent of preparing a plan tract on confirmation and in eighteen sixty one a preparation for confirmation a manual of eighty nine pages his veneration for the church's liturgical inheritance was great and the books of devotion he compiled and had printed for the use of soldiers during the war were drawn from the ancient sources he attached the utmost importance to the holy communion as a means of spiritual life and throughout the war he availed himself of every opportunity of administering it to the soldiers in camp in the wayside churches as he passed them and in towns where he temporarily rested with the army with a host of friends in nashville and vicinity who looked up to him with love and reverence it is not strange that dr quintard should have been the choice for chaplain of those who enlisted from that city for the defence of their homes and firesides in eighteen sixty one many of the young men of his parish enlisted in the first tennessee regiment of which he was elected chaplain and feeling as he did that these young men would need his spiritual care far more than those of his parishioners who were left behind he felt it his duty to accept the office and go with his regiment to the seat of war both he and his parishioners supposed that his absence would not exceed six months he did not return to nashville until after the collapse of the confederacy and the surrender of lee's army in eighteen sixty five during those four years he gathered up a rich fund of experiences both grave and gay always an accomplished raconteur and brilliant conversationalist it is but natural that a wide circle of friends in different parts of the world should have begged him to commit to writing the story of the war as he saw it and as none but he could tell it and permit its publication 
about the year eighteen ninety six he consented to do this and entered with considerable enthusiasm upon the literary task thus set for him it was quite characteristic of him however that the work as he projected it was likely to have been a laudation of the men with whom he was brought into contact during the civil strife at the expense of the personal experiences of which his friends were more anxious to read for dr quintard was an enthusiast and an optimist no man was ever more loyal to his friends than he his estimate of human character was always based upon whatever good he could find in a man nothing was a greater delight to him in recalling the scenes of the war than to describe some deed of heroism some noble trait of character or some mark of friendship that was shown him by a soldier to acknowledge some kindness shown him or to correct some error of judgment that had been passed upon some actor in the drama of the civil war some of the men whom he paused to eulogize were those to whom fame had otherwise done but scant justice and his estimate of them is in more than one instance an addition of worth to the history of the people of the southern states the death of dr quintard on the fifteenth of february eighteen ninety eight prevented the completion of the work he had begun more than two years previously but left it in such form that it has not been entirely impossible to gratify the wishes of his friends in regard thereto and to make a valuable contribution to the pictures of life in the southern states during the troubled days of the civil war end of preface and chapter one chapter two of dr quintard chaplain c s a and second bishop of tennessee by charles todd quintard this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two personal narrative the beginning of the war and valley mountain while rector of the church of the advent nashville i was elected chaplain of a military company of somewhat more than local fame known as the rock city guard this election was only a compliment shown me by the men who composed the guard i was not a military man nor had i any fondness for military life so i regarded myself as chaplain only by courtesy but on thanksgiving day eighteen sixty the rock city guard and other military organizations of nashville requested me to officiate at the thanksgiving services to be held under their auspices the services were held in the hall of representatives in the state capitol and there was an immense congregation present it was a time of great anxiety and the occasion was a memorable one rumors of approaching war were abundant and the newspapers were filled with discussions as to the course the south would pursue in case mr lincoln then recently elected should take his seat as president of the united states the subject of my discourse was obedience to rulers my text being righteousness exalted a nation but sin is a reproach to any people proverbs fourteen thirty four my sermon was what might be called a strong plea for the union in december south carolina seceded and on the eighteenth of the following april after a bombardment of thirty-four hours fort sumter surrendered and the civil war was fairly begun president lincoln at once called for seventy five thousand volunteers to serve for ninety days and put down the insurrection in south carolina tennessee being called upon for her quota responded through her governor isham g harris tennessee will not furnish a single man for coercion but fifty thousand if necessary for the defence of her rights or those of her southern brethren this undoubtedly expressed the sentiments of the vast majority of tennesseeans who did not favor secession and deplored war but who were nevertheless determined to stand with the people of the south in the spring of eighteen sixty one the states of virginia north carolina and arkansas which had hitherto refused to secede joined their fortunes to those of the already seceded states and in june tennessee decided to unite with the southern confederacy she was slow to draw the sword in april the rock city guard now enlarged into a battalion was mustered into the service of the state 
subsequently a regiment was formed consisting of the rock city guard and the following companies the williamson grays of williamson county the tennessee riflemen and the railroad boys of nashville the brown guards of maury county the rutherford rifles of rutherford county and the martin guards of giles county this was known as the first tennessee regiment the field officers elected were colonel george maney afterwards made a brigadier general lieutenant colonel t f sevier major a m looney lieutenant r b snowden of company c was appointed adjutant dr william nichol surgeon and dr j r bust assistant surgeon on the tenth of july eighteen sixty one orders were received by the regiment to repair to virginia being very urgently pressed by members of the rock city guard and their friends in nashville to accompany the regiment as chaplain i resolved to do so this of course made it necessary for me to break up my household i removed my family to georgia left my parish in the hands of the rev george c harris and prepared to join my regiment in virginia my friend general washington barrow who had formerly been minister to portugal thinking that i would have need of a weapon for my defence sent me his old court sword which had enjoyed a long and quiet rest so long indeed that it had become rusted in its scabbard i remember well my first attempt to unsheath the sword i seized the handle and pulled with might and main but to no effect a friend came to my assistance i took the sword handle he the scabbard we pulled and we pulled but the sword refused to come forth i am not aware that i ever succeeded in drawing that sword in defence of my country on my departure for virginia i left it at home the first battle of bull run was fought july twenty one eighteen sixty one my cousin captain thomas edward king of georgia having been severely wounded i went to richmond to look after him leaving nashville on the first of august after he had sufficiently recovered to return to his home i joined my regiment at valley mountain on the twenty third of august some of the entries made in my pocket diary while on this trip are not devoid of interest as illustrating the condition of the southern army and of the southern country at this early stage of the war my route was through knoxville and bristol at the latter place which is on the boundary line between tennessee and virginia i missed the train for lynchburg by an hour found all the hotels crowded and the railroad pressed to its utmost in conveying troops while waiting i visited two sick men from nashville of whom i had heard and then strolled out to camp a mile from the town there i witnessed the execution of the sentence of a court-martial upon two private soldiers convicted of selling whiskey to other soldiers the culprits were drummed around the camp riding on rails each with three empty bottles tied to his feet and a label ten cents a glass penned to his back at lynchburg i missed connections for richmond saturday night and so spent a very pleasant sunday in the former place i found lynchburg a very quaint old town built on steep hills from the foot of which the james river finds its way sluggishly to the sea i preached at st paul's church on the love of god arriving at richmond i found the place so crowded that i began to think i would not be able to get even a lodging the spotswood and exchange hotels were crowded to overflowing and i could not get the sign of a room though i did succeed in getting some dinner at the latter house but calling on the rev mr peterkin i was asked to stay with him and had for a co-guest the rev a toomer porter chaplain of the hampton legion after the war a prominent educator and founder of a famous school in charleston south carolina at the rev mr peterkins i had the pleasure of meeting the rev william nelson pendleton then a colonel in the confederate army afterwards a major-general in command of lee's artillery he had been in command of the artillery that did such execution at the battle of manassas and gave me a most interesting account of that fight there was not a masked battery on the ground his guns were within two hundred yards of the nearest of those of the enemy and within four hundred yards of those that were at the greatest distance yet he did not lose a man i learned from mr peterkin where to find my wounded cousin and with him found two other wounded soldiers 
i made daily visits to the wounded during my stay in richmond met bishop atkinson called with the rev mr porter upon mrs wade hampton who was a daughter of the hon george duffy and visited mr john stewart in his princely establishment four miles out from richmond where i attended services at the church built by mr stewart and his brother at a cost of fourteen thousand dollars it was at this time that i received and accepted my appointment as chaplain in the confederate army on the sunday i spent in the city that was shortly afterwards to become the capital of the confederate states i preached at st james church in the morning and at the monumental church in the evening and again at st james at night another interesting incident of this visit to richmond was in regard to the rev john flavel mines a chaplain in the federal army who had been captured released on parole and had been for two days at the rev mr peterkin's house where i met him by order of general winder he was rearrested and the poor fellow was quite crushed by the idea of having to go to prison he was especially fearful of contracting consumption of which some of his family had died he wrote two piteous letters to me begging me to intercede on his behalf after two efforts i succeeded in visiting him in the afterwards famous libby prison where i found him in company with the hon alfred ely a member of congress from rochester new york who had been captured at manassas i did all i could to cheer the prisoners up mr mines subsequently renounced the ministry and accepted a colonel's commission in the federal army after the war he entered upon a literary career and wrote some charming books under the nom de plume of felix old boy on my way to my regiment i found in staunton virginia that the deaf and dumb asylum was used as a hospital and i wrote to the editor of the nashville banner asking contributions from the citizens of tennessee for the sick and wounded and advising the establishing of a depository at staunton under the supervision of the rev james a latinay the citizens of staunton made up two boxes of stores and comforts for the sick of my regiment i preached in staunton sunday morning and night and left for millboro i went thence to huntersville which i reached on the twenty first of august after a bit of just the roughest travel i had ever made i found jackson's river so swollen by rains that it was impossible to ford with the stage the passengers mounted the horses two on each horse and forded the stream my traveling companion the night of this occurrence and the following day was colonel wheeler ex-minister to nicaragua vestryman in dr pinckney's church in washington d c one of the most agreeable men to take a trip with i had ever met his wife was a daughter of sully the artist we were again delayed at back creek and while waiting for a chance to cross i read master humphrey's clock a volume found in a knapsack on jackson's mountain the owner's name on the fly-leaf was b b ewing company one twelfth mississippi regiment the book was wet and mouldy i finally mounted one of the stage horses and swam the creek and so reached gatewoods a delightful place a valley shut in on all sides by most picturesque mountains it was twelve miles from huntersville i finally reached colonel fulton's camp over the worst road i ever traveled and thence found huntersville a most wretched and filthy town in those days where there were many sick soldiers in a meeting-house in public and private buildings and in tents huntersville was twenty-seven miles from valley mountain where our troops were stationed i was very anxious to get on for there was a battle daily expected resuming the journey in an ambulance i had to leave it within a mile in consequence of the wretched state of the roads and walked all day over the most horrible roads the rain at times coming down in torrents i felt occasionally that i must give out but finally reached big springs and received a warm welcome from general anderson general donelson colonel fulton major duval and other officers my clothes were so wet that the water could be wrung out of them and my first care was to dry them that done i set out for the camp at valley mountain three miles distant and reached it on the morning of friday the twenty third of august which happened to be the first clear day i had seen for more than a week 
the following sunday i began my duties as chaplain and had services in camp which were well attended that week our scouts had a running fire with the enemy's pickets and one of our lieutenants captured a federal soldier as it was the first achievement of the kind by any of our regiment our camp was greatly enlivened by it about this time i was appointed assistant surgeon but i did not wish to accept the office as i felt that it might separate me from my regiment i do not remember however any time throughout the war when there was any opportunity offered for me to assist the work of the surgeons that i did not do it one afternoon a courier arrived at colonel maney's headquarters with orders for the regiment to report to general loring while colonel maney was reading the order a sudden volley of small arms resounded through the mountain and some one thinking the federal forces had attacked general lee's position ordered the long roll beaten this startled the camp every man seized his gun and cartridge box and the regiment was at once in line for at that time the boys were all spoiling for a fight i well remember how good mrs sullivan the wife of an irish private and a kind of daughter of the regiment drew off her shoes and gave them to a soldier who was barefoot the boys started off for general lee's headquarters without rations without blankets and many of them without coats or shoes in this plight they reported for duty it was altogether a false alarm a regiment had been on picket duty and was firing off guns in order to clean them nevertheless it happened that the action of our boys was in conformity to an order received regularly enough about five minutes later requiring our regiment to take position within a very short distance of the enemy's entrenchments and the regiment remained out in consequence from friday morning until sunday in full view of the enemy a few days after this general lee determined on a movement on the enemy holding a fortified position on cheat pass the camp became a scene of great animation in anticipation of an important impending battle to me it was a memorable week beginning on monday september the eighth a week of such experiences as i had never dreamed would fall to my lot and of such fatigues as i never imagined myself capable of enduring general lee's plans were undoubtedly well and skilfully laid but the wisest schemes of mice and men gang off a glee the plan to my mind was somewhat complicated inasmuch as it demanded concerted action on the part of too many commanders far removed from each other thus general henry r jackson of georgia with rust of arkansas was to attack the enemy at cheat pass where he was strongly entrenched general loring with donelson was to engage the enemy at crouches and huttonville and force his way up to cheat pass while anderson with his brigade was to pass over cheat mountain and engage the enemy in the rear the rock city guard with the regiment left camp at valley mountain on monday and moved to a new camp three or four miles in advance i remained behind for a day to care for the sick and then followed the regiment at nine o'clock on tuesday morning general s r anderson's brigade consisting of colonel maney's regiment and two others started on the route was not by a road but through fields and over mountains the most precipitous in going up which we had to wind single file along the sides and reach the top by very circuitous paths the paths were exceedingly steep rocky and rough and our horses had to be taken to the rear at one time i reached the top of the mountain and sat down for a little rest under a great boulder that projected out into the pathway an officer in front called out to me tell them that the order is to double quick i passed the command to another officer who turned to those behind him who were struggling up the mountain pass and called out to them the order is to double quick back there whereupon the rear of the regiment turned and rushed down the mountain in the flight the major was upset and flat on his back and with heels in the air he poured forth benedictions of an unusual kind for a presbyterian elder our first night out after i had travelled twelve miles on foot i had lent to a less fortunate officer the horse that had been presented to me but a few days previously we halted at ten o'clock soon after it began to rain heavily 
i had been carrying the blankets of lieutenant j von Deer, who had been exceedingly kind to me throughout the march and when i came up to him he said i have a capital place where we may sleep i'll put my blankets on the ground and will cover with yours as they are heavier so he cleaned out a hollow on the side of the mountain and there we lay down for the night we had my blanket and his rubber coat for a covering shortly after midnight a little river began running down my neck the rain was pouring in torrents and the basin van leer had scooped out was soon filled so i spent the night as did the georgia soldier who said that he had slept in the bed of a river with a thin sheet of water over him this was not altogether a unique experience for me as we shall soon see the next morning after breaking our fast on cold meat and gutta percha bread we took up our line of march and had gone but a mile or so when we heard the fire of musketry at our left we supposed this was by the scouts sent out by general donelson this day wednesday was the severest of all upon our men we made slow progress and the march was very toilsome we kept perfect silence expecting every moment to come up with scouting parties of the enemy at about three o'clock the order was passed along the line just as one half of the regiment had reached the top of the mountain to double quick forward the drums of the enemy were distinctly heard and we moved as rapidly as possible and were about an hour in descending all the horses were left behind as the mountain was found so steep and rocky that it was impossible for them to go any further we clambered down the rocks clinging to the bushes and jumping from rock to rock and at nine o'clock we halted for the night not a word was spoken above a whisper nor a fire lighted although it was very cold van leer arranged our blankets as on the previous night and with much the same result for soon after we lay down the rain came as though the windows of heaven were opened and about eleven o'clock we were thoroughly saturated a rivulet ran down my back and joe and i actually lay in a pool of water all night i thought it impossible for me to stand it but as there was no alternative i kept quiet and thought over all i had read of the benefits of hydropathy i consoled myself with the reflection that the water cure might relieve me of an intense pain i had suffered for some hours in my left knee and so it did at the same time i would hesitate long before recommending the same treatment for every other pain in the left knee in the morning i was well soaked my finger ends were corrugated and my whole body chilled through i was very hungry also but all i could get to eat was one tough biscuit that almost defied my most vigorous assaults we were ordered to be on the parkersburg pike that day thursday at daybreak to show how little we understood the art of war at that time soon after we started a well-mounted horseman passed halfway down the line of the regiment without detection he proved to be a federal courier lieutenant colonel servier finally halted him and said in surprise why you're a yankee to which the courier coolly replied i'm so thankful you found me out i was so afraid of being shot the colonel took from him a fine pair of pistols sword carbine and his horse which he gave to major looney who was thoroughly knocked up half a mile further on brought us to the parkersburg pike three miles and a half from cheap mountain pass the brigade was as rapidly as possible put in position the first tennessee was at the head of a column towards cheat pass in about ten minutes a body of the enemy about one hundred strong in ambush on the opposite side of the road and only about twenty-five yards from our troops began firing into our left composed of the companies from pulaski columbia and murfreesboro the enemy were completely concealed but our men stood the fire nobly not a man flinched after two or three volleys had been fired captain field ordered a charge and the enemy fled we lost two killed two missing and sixteen wounded we captured lieutenant merrill of the engineer corps u s a attached to general rosecrans command i fell into conversation with him and found him not only a most intelligent gentleman but also a most genial and pleasant companion as most west pointers are 
we also captured seven privates and left on the roadside two wounded men of the enemy who were so disabled that they could not be moved though we dressed their wounds and made them as comfortable as possible the enemy lost some eight or ten killed how many wounded i do not know my first experience in actual battle was very different from what i had anticipated i had expected an open field and a fair fight but this bushwhacking was entirely out of my line the balls whistled in a way that can never be appreciated by one who has not heard them we held our position until four o'clock in the afternoon anxiously listening for general h r jackson's fire upon which the whole movement depended but not a gun was heard in that direction general donelson however met a party of the enemy and engaged them killing seventeen and taking sixty-eight prisoners he then waited for us of course waited in vain and like us withdrew when we left the turnpike we took with us our wounded all but five of whom were carried on horses the others on litters about two miles from the highway we came to the house of a mr white where we deposited seven of our wounded men and left them the brigade halted in a meadow after attending to the wounded i lay down by a wheat stack with joe van leer who made a very comfortable bed for us at daylight i returned to the house to assist the surgeons in dressing the wounds of our men this occupied us until nine o'clock the brigade in the meantime had moved forward and left us we supposed that they had stationed a guard for our protection but it had been neglected and when we left a man suggested to us that we better remove the white badges from our caps for we might come across some scouting parties of the enemy we took his advice and in addition i took the precaution to tie a white handkerchief to a stick and so i led the way after winding about over the fields for a mile or so we came upon a body of men behind a fallen tree with their guns pointed at us ready to fire we heard the click of the locks and i instantly threw up the white flag and this possibly saved our party from being shot down by our own men it was a detachment that had been sent back for us and as they saw us winding along without our badges they supposed us a party of the enemy on the trail of our forces one man was very much overcome when he found out who we were about a mile further on we came up with the main body of our troops which had been halted for us by colonel hatton and who on discovering that we were in the rear ran the whole length of the column to inform general anderson of the fact it felt mighty good to get with the brigade again in less than half an hour after we left mr white's house a party of the enemy was in possession there at half past twelve word was passed along the line that the enemy were following us immediately a line of battle was formed but very shortly we moved on to get a more advantageous position we rolled down one precipice and climbed up another and again the line of battle was formed then it was discovered that a small part of the enemy's forces was on its way by a route that crossed ours to reinforced crouches so there was no fighting friday night we camped about one mile from the place we occupied our first night out i had no provisions but various persons gave me what made up a tolerably good supper to wit a roasting ear a slice of bacon and a biscuit and in the morning i found on a log a good-sized piece of fresh meat not strikingly clean but i sliced off a piece of it and cooked it on a long stick the fire i reckon removed all impurities and joe van leer brought me half a cup of coffee and another biscuit we rested here until seven o'clock at night when we took up our march for brady's gate at about eleven o'clock we rested for the night and had the pleasure of meeting two men from nashville who had brought out a couple of ambulances loaded with knick-knacks for the rock city guard out of their supplies we had a comfortable breakfast and again started for brady's gate and reached it at one p m at this point the enemy had been in great numbers some three or four thousand everywhere in the woods they had erected comfortable booths and rustic benches our brigade took position expecting an attack and waited until half past six and then once more started on our march about eight o'clock the rain poured down in torrents and once more we were thoroughly drenched 
the brigade remained all night in an open meadow but colonel severe insisted upon my taking his horse and so i rode forward with major looney and some other officers to a house half a mile further on and dr buist van leer myself and five others took up quarters for the night in a smoke-house unfortunately the shingles were off just over my head and the rain came through pretty freely the next morning we started for our old camp at valley mountain which we reached at eleven o'clock it really seemed like getting home the tents looked more than familiar inviting even i rested well and ate well and felt well generally the march left many of our men barefooted some of them made the last of the tramp in their stocking feet and when we reached our quarters they had not even a thread to cover them one of captain jack butler's men made the remark that if the enemy took the captain prisoner they would not believe him if he told them his rank and when i looked at the dear fellow ragged and barefooted with feet cut and swollen i thought so too but then when i looked down at my own feet and saw my own toes peeping nay rather boldly showing themselves as plain as the nose on my face and found that almost a majority of our regiment were bootless and shoeless by the hardness of the march i realized what we had gone through the path by which we ascended to the top of cheat mountain was one which the foot of man probably never trod before the guide said that he knew that he could cross it but did not think that the brigade could i would not have undertaken the march i presume could i have foretold what it would be i made the whole trip with the exception of a few miles on foot for the morning we started out lieutenant john house of franklin a noble fellow was very weak from an attack of fever from which he had not entirely convalesced i insisted upon his taking my horse and so i did not ride at all until sunday the fifteenth my horse proved a most valuable one on our return one of the wounded men rode her down the steepest hills and she did not once miss a foot being raised in that region she had the faculty of adapting herself to the provender while other tennessee horses grew thin and became useless as a result of the expedition our forces had driven in all the outposts of the enemy made a thorough survey of all their works had killed wounded and captured about two hundred of their men and all with a loss of less than thirty on our side but the campaign in that section was abandoned and all our forces were transferred to another section i was very glad to believe that my labors among the soldiers as their chaplain were not all thrown away it was very delightful to see how well our regular daily evening service in camp was attended and i was greatly pleased to find so many of the young men anxious to receive holy communion when i celebrated on the fifteenth sunday after trinity the day before we started on the expedition the whole regiment seemed devoted to me one of the captains told the major that he believed every man in his company would lay down his life for me certainly i met nothing but kindness from officers and men and so i was led to hope that some good would yet grow out of the seed sown on those wild mountains on friday the thirteenth of september general loring was anxious to have a reconnaissance made and assigned the duty to major fitzhugh lee son of general robert e lee colonel j a washington a brother-in-law of general lee and one of his personal aides asked permission to accompany the party which was granted they had advanced a considerable distance when major lee told the colonel that it was unsafe for them to proceed further but the colonel was anxious to make a thorough exploration major lee however decided not to endanger the lives of his men by taking them along and so halted them and rode on with colonel washington accompanied by two privates they had not gone far when they were fired upon by a large picket guard lying in ambush by the roadside colonel washington was instantly killed being pierced by three balls through the breast major lee's horse was shot under him and one of the privates also lost his horse major lee escaped on colonel washington's horse a flag was sent to the federal camp the next day by general lee and colonel washington's body was given up 
the enemy offered to send it the whole distance in an ambulance but this offer colonel stark the bearer of the flag declined this sad occurrence was the occasion of my first acquaintance with general lee the most conspicuous character in the struggle between the states i saw him at cheat mountain when he had just learned of the death of colonel washington he was standing with his right arm thrown over the neck of his horse a blooded animal thoroughly groomed and i was impressed first of all by the man's splendid physique and then by the look of extreme sadness that pervaded his countenance he felt the death of his relative very keenly and seemed greatly dispirited it was my high privilege later on to be brought in contact with this great and good man and to learn most thoroughly to appreciate his exalted character and to understand why his life is to-day an enduring inheritance of his country and of the church of christ personally he was a man of rare gifts physical and mental to these were added the advantages of finished culture he was a very bayard in manner and bearing the habits of temperance frugality and self-control formed by him in youth adhered to him through life end of chapter two chapter three of dr quintard chaplain c s a and second bishop of tennessee by charles todd quintard this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three personal narrative big sewell mountain winchester and romney from valley mountain i was sent with the sick of our brigade to a place called edray where a number of our troops were encamped i think it was about sixteen miles distant but on account of the condition of the roads i was fully three days in making the trip i had given up my horse to lieutenant van leer and i was busy each day of the march administering to the wants of the sick several of whom died on the way a cup of strong coffee was made for me by the sergeant in command of our escort we had coffee in those days later our ingenuity was taxed to discover substitutes for it which was the only thing that refreshed me on the march instead of a coffee-mill a hatchet-handle was used to beat up the grains which were then boiled in a tin cup i was a long time drinking that cup of coffee the last day of the journey i felt myself breaking down and determined to reach edray as soon as possible accordingly i took the middle of the road not avoiding the holes which were abundant and walked through slush and mud reaching edray just in the gloaming there was one brick house in the place to which i made my way to my delight i found there major looney of my regiment who received me with great cordiality i was so exhausted that i was obliged to support myself in my chair and the major seeing how greatly prostrated i was gave me a large drink of brandy it produced not the slightest effect on me and so in fifteen minutes more he repeated the dose and richard was himself again i went out at once borrowed a horse of a friend who was a lieutenant in a virginia regiment and rode back to meet my sick train the next day i officiated at the burial of those who had died en route shortly after this general lee ordered us to reinforce general john b floyd who was strongly entrenched at big sewell mountain facing the federal army under general rosecrans and only a mile distant i passed through the hot springs on the way to big sewell mountain and from there making our way was very gradual for rains had been destructive of the roads in some places every trace of the road had been so completely washed away that no one would dream that any had ever been where were then gullies eight or ten feet or even fifteen feet deep fences bridges and even houses had been washed away farms ruined and at white sulphur springs the guest had to be taken from the lower story of the hotel major looney captain foster and myself were detained at this point for several days and i went back and forth to hold services and to visit the sick 
at big sewell mountain i was brought into very pleasant relations with general lee at white sulphur springs mrs lee had entrusted me with a parcel to deliver to the general at my first opportunity upon my arrival i at once called upon him and spent several hours with him in most delightful intercourse from his headquarters we could see the whole federal encampment with the audacity of ignorance i said to him why general there are the federals why don't we attack them in his gentle voice he replied ah it is sometimes better to wait until you are attacked from the camp at big sewell mountain i was sent in the latter part of october to accompany a detachment of our sick men to the hospitals at white sulphur and hot springs virginia when i reached the latter place being only fifteen miles from a railroad i determined to run down to staunton to get if possible some clean clothing my visit was timely for a few hours after my arrival in staunton i received by train two boxes one from rome georgia and one from nashville in the latter box were two pairs of heavy winter boots a pair of winter pants flannel underclothing and a great variety of useful articles and my wardrobe was now so generally well supplied that i could help along some who were in worse condition than i was in my visit to staunton was otherwise a rich treat somehow or other everybody seemed to have heard of me or to know me and all extended to me the most overflowing cordiality and hospitality i was first the guest of the rev mr latinay and afterwards of dr stribling the superintendent of the insane asylum mrs stribling and her daughter sent by me two trunks filled with things for our regiment and a lady met me on the street and handed me ten dollars for the use of the sick about the middle of november i received orders from general loring to proceed from huntersville to the lewisburg line and to transport all the sick and convalescent belonging to his division to the hospitals at warm hot and bath alum springs i accordingly left general loring's headquarters one friday at noon and crossing the greenbrier bridge six miles above huntersville took the road to hillsborough a little hamlet ten miles distant where i spent the night very pleasantly without charge at the home of mr baird thence i rode to the residence of mr rennick sixteen miles and found three of our regiment who had been sick for some weeks but were then greatly improved and glad to get away under my protection on sunday morning i rode five miles to the town of frankfurt and my name and fame having preceded me i was urged to have services in the presbyterian church of course i was very glad to do so and had a good and very attentive congregation at frankfurt there lived a dr rennick who had been extremely kind to all of our tenancy soldiers he turned his home into a hospital and he and his wife devoted themselves most assiduously to the welfare of the sick refusing any remuneration i stopped at his house and at his request baptized his youngest child a little girl about eighteen months old born on easter sunday the parents were quite unacquainted with the ecclesiastical calendar yet the father said i'm going to give her a good episcopal name doctor and so he had me give her in baptism the name of margaret easter sunday i was glad she was not born on quinquagesima sunday for i might in that case have had to give her that name the following day i went to lewisburg and thence to white sulphur springs hoping to be in part relieved by one of the surgeons whom i ordered to join his regiment with the sick men belonging to it there were more than one thousand patients at white sulphur springs and there had been forty deaths within the past thirteen days i shall never forget the dinner we had in camp one sunday about the last of november it was the best of the season beef venison preserved peaches raspberries and plums rice fine old madeira currant wine and many other things most of which had been sent by dr stribling made a real feast quite in contrast with our usual camp fare at that time the boys were going into winter quarters and were building very snug roofed cabins one sunday early in december after having service in the camp near huntersville with a pass from general loring to go to richmond and return at the public charge 
i started first for staunton to look after the interests of a young man from maury county tennessee who while in a state of intoxication killed another man by the accidental discharge of his pistol that i arrived safely in staunton i felt to be a matter of special congratulation on account of the roads i had to travel the mud was from two to three feet deep the young prisoner was a noble fellow to whom i had become very much attached and was clear of any intentional wrong i was sure after calling upon him in staunton and consulting with his lawyer we concluded to engage the services of the hon alexander h stewart formerly secretary of the interior under president fillmore and i went to richmond to see that eminent man on my return to staunton i had the trial put off until the january term of court when it was finally held i was called upon to testify to the good character of the accused and i am glad to say that the verdict of the jury was in the end not guilty our regiment's stay at big sewell was not long there was a good deal of marching to and fro and rosecrans finally escaped lee and jackson from big sewell general loring to whose division we were attached was invited to join general thomas j jackson at winchester there for the first time i met that distinguished general and i was very cordially received by the rev mr meredith the rector of the parish and was made to feel quite at home in the rectory this was the beginning of a severe and disastrous campaign the weather was bitterly cold and during the second night of our encampment a severe snowstorm arose i can never forget the appearance of the troops as they arose the next morning from their snowy couches it suggested thoughts of the resurrection morn in spite of it all the troops were very cheerful and as they shook the snow from their uniforms began singing a song the chorus of which was so let the wild world wag as it will we'll be gay and happy still after some delay we began our march against bath on new year's day eighteen sixty two it was one of the coldest winters known to the oldest inhabitant snow sleet and rain came down upon us in all their wrath we had a skirmish on the march general jackson wished to drive the enemy's forces from the gap at capon mountain opposite bath where they were posted i begged him to allow me to bring up the first tennessee regiment they were some distance in the rear but i brought them forward in short time as they passed by in double quick the general said to me what a splendid regiment in his report of the engagement general jackson said the order to drive the enemy from the hill was undertaken with a patriotic enthusiasm which entitles the first tennessee and its commander to special praise it was here that captain bullock issued his unique command here you boys just separate three or four yards and pie root pirouette they did pirouette and made the enemy dance as well as the federal troops retreated through the gap in the mountain they came face to face with the brigade of the virginia militia each fired a volley and fled as fast as legs could carry them in opposite directions to the boys looking down upon the scene from the mountain it was a comical sight as the infantry put the federals to flight on capon mountain captain turner ashby drove the federal cavalry along the highway in the valley like leaves before the wind we reached romney without further obstruction on sunday i officiated at a church which was crowded to its utmost capacity i shall never forget the grave attention which stonewall jackson paid to my discourse the text from which i preached was be sure your sin will find you out the march from winchester to romney was one of great hardship and was utterly fruitless of military results the situation in our camp in the latter part of january eighteen sixty two was rather disturbed the two generals stonewall jackson and loring did not work well together their commands were separate jackson commanded the army of the valley district loring the army of the northwest 
the former had written begging the secretary of war to send loring and all his forces to cooperate with him jackson in that section and expressing the opinion that the two could drive the enemy from the whole region the secretary of war enclosed jackson's letter to loring leaving the movement to his loring's discretion but at the same time expressing his opinion and that of the president as decidedly in favor of it accordingly loring went expecting some prompt and decided work but no sooner had he arrived in winchester than general jackson began to work to merge the two armies into one and to take general loring's command under his control jackson had but one brigade while loring had three under his control the troops of the latter from the highest officer to the lowest private were perfectly devoted to their general of course a vast amount of ill-feeling was stirred up and the affair reached a climax when an order was issued for our troops to build winter quarters in romney while jackson's brigade marched back to ease and comfort at winchester i cannot begin to tell all that our troops suffered through the stupidity and want of forethought as i then thought it of major-general jackson it is enough to say that we were subjected to the severest trials that human nature could endure we left winchester with twenty seven hundred men in general anderson's brigade of tennesseans that number was reduced to eleven hundred when we reached the position opposite the town of hancock maryland the first regiment numbered six hundred and eighty in romney it mustered only two hundred and thirty men fit for duty i felt that general loring ought to demand that he might be allowed to withdraw his forces from the command of major-general jackson so far as the personal staff of general loring including myself was concerned it was comfortably situated in a very pleasant new house but no one could possibly imagine the horrible condition of affairs at romney among the troops and when stonewall jackson took his command back to winchester the men of loring's command shouted to them there go your f f v s the pet lambs of the stonewall brigade were comfortably housed at winchester while the troops of loring's command were left behind in romney to endure the bitter biting weather this movement on the part of jackson was the subject of much bitter comment a report thereof was taken to richmond and laid before the secretary of war he was greatly surprised that jackson should have withdrawn his forces to winchester leaving the reinforcing column behind or as it was expressed at the time leaving the guests the invited guests out in the cold as a result of the controversy that ensued general jackson was required by the secretary of war to direct general loring to return with his command to winchester this we did on the first of february and while in winchester i was called to officiate at the funerals of a number of our men who had died from sickness and exposure and it was while there that we received the news of the fall of fort donelson although jackson complied with the order of the secretary of war he regarded it as a case of interference with his command and took umbrage it was by the exercise of great tact on the part of general joseph e johnston commander-in-chief of the department and of governor john letcher of virginia that jackson was prevailed upon to withhold his resignation and his valuable services were preserved to the army of the confederacy on the tenth of february eighteen sixty two the first and third regiments tennessee volunteers with a georgia regiment were by the command of the secretary of war ordered to proceed to knoxville tennessee and to report for duty to general albert sidney johnston a different disposition was made of the seventh and fourteenth tennessee volunteers and of an arkansas regiment and all the remainder of the command of brigadier general loring was to proceed to manassas virginia to report for duty to general joseph e johnston it was with a sad heart that the boys of the first tennessee bade farewell on the seventh of february to the seventh and fourteenth regiments and to their warm-hearted and hospitable virginia friends during the march against romney general loring had me commissioned by the secretary of war as his aide-de-camp 
i was very strongly opposed to holding such a commission and declined to accept but i could not leave general loring in the troubles and anxieties that distressed him and so as a member of his staff i travelled around considerably at that time going from camp to camp attending the trial of my friend at staunton and going to richmond on military business to get from romney to staunton on one occasion i had to take a horseback ride of forty-three miles to winchester then to go by stage eighteen miles to strasburg and thence by rail via manassas and gordonsville this was a roundabout way but was preferable at the time to a much shorter route down the valley from winchester on the twenty first of february i went with general loring to norfolk to which point he had been ordered instead as i had hoped to georgia where i would have been nearer my family at this time he was promoted to major-general we went of course by way of richmond where i called with him on president jefferson davis and was very agreeably disappointed in his personal appearance and bearing i might have witnessed the ceremonies of his inauguration but as the day set for that function proved very inclement i was glad that i chose to spend it on the cars between richmond and norfolk on that day general loring had a very severe chill followed by congestion of the right lung which was the precursor of an attack of pneumonia affecting both lungs i watched by his bedside in norfolk throughout all his illness which prolonged my visit in that city for several weeks End of chapter three chapter four of dr quintard chaplain c s a and second bishop of tennessee by charles todd quintard this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four personal narrative norfolk at norfolk i had the pleasure of intercourse with such friends as john tatnall son of commander tatnall benjamin loyal and lieutenant walter butt of the ironclad virginia with the clergy of the city and with many charming families how can i ever forget the old-time virginia hospitality that was meted out to me the enthusiastic reception i had from all kinds and conditions of men how well i remember mr taswell taylor he was well up in genealogy and not only knew all the old families of virginia but the principal families of the whole south it was quite delightful to hear him in the midst of war's alarums talk over old times and old folks those days before the war were all so different from what we have known since no one born since the war can write intelligently of the blessed old days in the south but if any one would read a true account of the trials and woes of a southern household during the dreadful war time let him read the diary of a southern refugee during the war written by mrs judith w mcguire for the members of her family who were too young to remember those days mrs mcguire's book is a wonderful record of hope joys sorrows and trials and of the way in which amid it all the faithful women of the south cheered the hearts of the heroes in the field one sunday in march i preached a sermon at st paul's church old st paul's built in seventeen thirty nine exhorting the people to the work before them reminding them that in the conflict in which we were engaged not only the rights of our people and the glory of our nation but the church of god was imperiled it was my old war sermon rearranged for virginia at the solicitation of clergy and people formally presented i repeated it several times in norfolk on ash wednesday i preached again in st paul's to a fine congregation and was requested to repeat my sermon which was on the good samaritan the following sunday in the same church and subsequently in christ church i met many persons of distinction in the city general huger who was in command in norfolk called upon me general howell cobb was there as commissioner on the part of the confederate government to arrange with general wood on the part of the united states about the exchange of prisoners in the latter part of february i became interested in the transformation by which the merrimac became the virginia of the confederate navy one day i slipped off from my patient general loring while he was sleeping 
and went to portsmouth to visit the wonderful craft the part that appeared above water suggested to me a book opened at an angle of forty-five degrees and the four edges of its cover placed on a table at the bow was a sharp projection by which it was expected to pierce the side of any ship it might run against all the machinery was below water the roof was about thirty-eight inches in thickness of timber very heavily plated with iron the fore and aft guns were the heaviest carrying shot and shell eighty-five and ninety pounds in weight the others were very heavy also and magnificent of their kind she carried ten guns in all her new steel-pointed and wrought iron shot were destined to do some terrific work she was likely to escape injury unless struck below the water-line and there was not much danger of that occurring as she was in a measure protected below that line also she drew rather too much water as lieutenant spotswood told me at the time of my visit while i was at norfolk the great battle between the virginia and the monitor and ships of war congress and cumberland took place i witnessed the destruction of the congress and the cumberland the first day's fight was on the eighth of march by special invitation the rev j h d wingfield who afterwards became bishop of northern california celebrated the blessed sacrament in his church trinity church portsmouth for the officers of the virginia before they went into battle when the virginia cast off her moorings at norfolk navy yard and steamed down the river the congress and the cumberland frigates had been lying for some time off newport news officers and men on the virginia were taking things quietly as if they were really on an ordinary trial trip as they drew near the congress captain buchanan the commander of the virginia made a brief and stirring appeal to his crew which was answered by cheers he then took his place by the side of the pilot near the wheel my friend lieutenant j r eggleston commanded the nine-inch broadside guns next abaft the engine-room hatch and he was ordered to serve one of them with hot shot suddenly he saw a great ship near at hand bearing down upon the virginia in a moment twenty-five solid shot and shell struck the sloping side of the virginia and glanced high into the air many of the shells exploding in their upward flight in reply to this broadside from the congress one red-hot shot and three nine-inch shells were hurled into her and the virginia steamed on without pausing suddenly there was a jar as if the vessel had run aground there was a cheering forward and lieutenant eggleston passed aft waving his hat and crying we have sunk the cumberland she had been struck about midship by the prow of the virginia and in sinking tore the prow from the bow of her assailant and carried it down with her the virginia then moved some distance up the river in order to turn about in the narrow channel as soon as the congress saw her terrible foe coming down upon her she tried to escape under sail but ran aground in the effort the virginia took position under her stern and a few raking shots brought down her flag captain porcher in command of the confederate ship beaufort made an effort to take the officers and wounded men of the congress prisoners two officers came on board the beaufort and surrendered the congress captain porcher asked them to get the officers and wounded men aboard his vessel as quickly as possible as he had been ordered to burn the congress he was begged not to do so as there were sixty wounded men on board the congress but his orders were peremptory while he was making every effort to move the wounded a tremendous fire was opened on the beaufort from the shore the federal officers begged him to hoist a white flag lest all the wounded men should be killed the fact that the federals were firing on a white flag flying from the mainmast of the congress was brought to the attention of the federal officers who claimed however that they were powerless to stop the fire as it proceeded from a lot of volunteers who were not under the control of the officers on board the beaufort the fire continuing captain porcher returned it but with little effect he estimated the loss in the federal fleet in killed drowned wounded and missing of nearly four hundred men the total loss of the confederates did not exceed sixty captain buchanan and his flag lieutenant were wounded and taken to the naval hospital at norfolk 
catesby jones succeeded to the command of the virginia about an hour before midnight the fire reached the magazine of the congress and she blew up the next day the virginia steamed out towards the minnesota when the monitor made her appearance the latter came gallantly forward and then began the first battle ever fought between ironclads it continued several hours neither vessel so far as could be ascertained at the time inflicting by her fire any very serious damage on the other the virginia then got ready to try what ramming would do for the monitor what it did was to silence the latter forever in the presence of the virginia unfortunately just before the virginia struck the monitor the former stopped her engine under the belief that the momentum of the ship would prove sufficient for the work had the virginia kept on at full speed she would undoubtedly have run the monitor under as it was the latter got such a shaking up that she sought safety in shoal water whither she knew the virginia could not follow her it should be remembered that the virginia drew twenty-two feet of water and was very hard to manage whereas the monitor was readily managed and drew but ten feet of water the following day the rev mr wingfield was called upon to offer up prayers and thanksgiving for the victory on board the gallant ship it was a solemn most impressive and affecting scene as those valiant men of war fell upon their knees on the deck and bowed their heads in reverence and godly fear the weather-beaten faces of many of the brave seamen were observed to be bathed in tears and trembling with emotion under the influence of that memorable service after this commodore tatnall was placed in command of the virginia and on the morning of the eleventh of april the virginia went down hampton roads with the design of engaging the enemy to the fullest extent i received a concise cipher telegram splinters was all it said from my dear friend john tatnall son of the commodore and i at once set out to see what was going on with general loring who was by that time fully recovered from his illness and quite a party of friends and officers i went down the bay in a cockle-shell of a steamer to witness the engagement in order to provoke the enemy commodore tatnall ordered two of his gunboats to run into the transport anchorage and cut out such of the vessels as were lying nearest the virginia this was successfully done within sight of and almost within gunshot of the monitor but she could not be drawn into an engagement although the enemy refused to fight the monitor threw a number of shells several of which passed over our little steamer we deemed it therefore good military and naval tactics to withdraw and let the contestants attend to their own business End of chapter four chapter five of dr quintard chaplaincy essay and second bishop of tennessee by charles todd quintard this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five personal narrative perryville hearing about this time of the extreme illness of my bishop the right rev james harvey oti in jackson mississippi i left norfolk with considerable regret for the society of that city i had found most charming and my stay there had been very pleasant i went by way of mobile having for my travelling companion from montgomery alabama to that city captain j f lay a brother of the then bishop of arkansas the captain was a member of beauregard's staff general forney was in command at mobile and i had a very pleasant chat with him his left arm was still almost useless from a severe wound received in the drainsville fight i met also the rev mr pierce who afterwards became bishop of arkansas and madame levert one of the most distinguished of southern writers i had a drive down the bay over one of the finest shell roads in the world and on the sunday that i spent in mobile i preached my war sermon adapted of course to the people of mobile i found my beloved bishop at the residence of mrs george yerger in jackson and remained in attendance on him for several weeks he was then removed from jackson to the residence of mrs johnstone at annandale 
there he enjoyed all that kindness and wealth could give he was able to drive out after a time and i remember how thoroughly he enjoyed the music of the spring birds there was one bird that he called the wood robin whose notes were especially enjoyed and the carriage was frequently stopped that he might listen to the warbling of this bird from annandale i went to visit my family in rome georgia and spent some time in attendance upon the hospitals there then i returned to general loring's headquarters for a brief visit to the general to whom i was warmly attached and to make farewell visits to sundry officers and bid my old military companions a final adieu for my intention it then was to leave the army general loring's headquarters were at new river virginia at a place called the narrows because the river gashed through peter's mountain which rises abruptly from the banks on either side the general and all the staff gave me a most cordial greeting but the former told me i had no business to resign and that he had kept the place open for me if i would not be his aide he had a place for me as chaplain but my resignation had already been accepted on the fourteenth of june by the secretary of war as soon as i had determined to resign i forwarded to the secretary of war a copy of my resignation to general loring and the former had accepted it the general colonel meyer colonel fitzhugh and myself with a cavalry escort went for a little outing to the salt sulphur springs dining on our way at the gray sulphur springs the former place was really one of the pleasantest of all the watering places i visited in virginia the grounds were rolling well laid out and very well shaded the houses were principally of stone and capable of accommodating about four hundred guests there were two springs of great value there the salt sulphur and the iodine the first possessed all the sensible properties of sulphur water in general its odor for instance was very like that of a tolerable egg and might be perceived at some distance from the spring and in taste it was cousin german to a strong solution of epsom salts and magnesia like most of the sulphurous this water was transparent and deposited a whitish sediment composed of its various saline ingredients mingled with sulphur the iodine spring was altogether remarkable and was the only one possessing similar properties in all the country round it was peculiarly adapted to cutaneous eruptions and glandular diseases the salt sulphur spring was hemmed in on every side by mountains general william wing loring of whom i was then taking my leave was not only a very charming companion but he was altogether a remarkable man a braver man never lived he was a north carolinian by birth and only a few years older than myself yet he was already the hero of three wars the seminole war the war with mexico and that in which we were then engaged and in eighteen forty nine he had marched across the continent to oregon with some united states troops as an escort for a party of gold seekers he had also engaged in indian warfare and had taken part in the utah expedition in eighteen fifty eight his frontier services in the united states army were equalled only by those of that grand soldier albert sidney johnston the following year he had leave of absence from the army and visited europe egypt and the holy land he was in command of the department of new mexico in may eighteen sixty one and resigned to accept a commission as brigadier general in the confederate army as major general he served to the end of the war leading a division and frequently commanding a corps always with credit to himself and to the service in which he was engaged it was at vicksburg in eighteen sixty three that he received the familiar nickname of old blizzard after the war he took service with the khedive of egypt as general of brigade and was decorated in eighteen seventy five with the imperial order of osmaria and was promoted to be general of a division four years later he was mustered out of the egyptian service in eighteen eighty three he published a confederate soldier in egypt a most readable book he died in new york city three years later at the age of sixty eight i officiated at his funeral in st augustine florida on the nineteenth of march eighteen eighty six 
the commanding general of the army post at st augustine acted as one of the pallbearers and at the cemetery the body was borne from the gun carriage to the grave by three federal and three ex-confederate soldiers a salute was fired at the grave by a battery of united states artillery i had looked toward the diocese of alabama for some parochial work but the bishop of alabama the right rev dr wilmer not only could offer me no work in his jurisdiction but strongly advised me to go back to the army as chaplain and surgeon assuring me that there was work for me in that capacity in june i had a petition from my old regiment to rejoin it i had no difficulty in getting a chaplain's commission general loring wrote me a strong letter and that with the aid of a telegram from general and bishop polk secured it so i returned to the army of tennessee at chattanooga and was enthusiastically received by the officers and members of my regiment and especially by general polk and his staff upon which i found my dear friends colonel harry yeatman colonel william b richmond and colonel william d gale in august eighteen sixty two we advanced into kentucky crossing over walden's ridge and the cumberland mountains by way of pikeville and sparta tennessee my first intention was to leave chattanooga with general polk and his staff but on finding that dr buist was going alone i concluded to accompany him so we two started off at ten a m on the twenty eighth of august and followed the route of our immense wagon drain which stretched out for miles along the road we supposed we were all right and knew nothing to the contrary until we reached the top of walden's ridge where we found general bragg general buckner and governor harris the governor put us right as to our way and we had a long ride back to get into the road taken by our brigade which was quite different from that taken by the wagon train we rode until four o'clock in the afternoon and then stopped at a house that was crowded with soldiers and refugees we had a bed made on the floor for us and with many others slept well until one a m when we started on and after a couple of hours learned that the army had halted we rode into camp about thirty miles from chattanooga at dinner time with ravenous appetites we were having pretty good living just then for the country was admirably watered a great many country women visited our camp to hear our band play we continued our march to mumfordville kentucky where the louisville and nashville railroad crosses green river there on the sixteenth of september with a loss of fifty killed and wounded we captured some four thousand prisoners with as many guns and much ammunition besides killing and wounding seven hundred of the enemy the federal forces were commanded by general wilder since the war a most prominent citizen of chattanooga for whom i entertained the heartiest and most cordial regard general chalmers one of general bragg's brigadiers was conspicuous in this fight for the gallantry and skill with which he handled his troops when the federal forces surrendered on the seventeenth i stood beside the road and saw them lay down their arms though there were but four thousand i thought as they passed by me that the whole federal army had surrendered to general bragg the night following this battle i found a sleeping place in a graveyard on the twenty third of september we reached bardstown kentucky and took possession in the meantime general buell leaving a strong guard at nashville marched to louisville where his army was increased to fully one hundred thousand men it was not until october and after he had reorganized his army and was in danger of being superseded in the command thereof that he began his campaign against general bragg's forces the latter had collected an immense train mostly of federal army wagons loaded with supplies and it being clear that the two great objects of our invasion of kentucky the evacuation of nashville and the inducement of kentucky to join the confederacy would fail bragg decided only to gain time to effect a retreat with his spoils he harassed the advance of buell on bardstown and springfield retired to danville and thence marched to harrodsburg to effect a juncture with general kirby smith on the seventh of october he moved to perryville where on wednesday the eighth a battle was fought between a portion of bragg's army and buell's advance commanded by general mccook 
at this battle of perryville our regiment captured from the federals four twelve-pounder napoleon brass guns which were afterwards by special order presented to the battery of maney's brigade the night before the battle i shared blankets in a barnyard with general leonidas polk bishop of louisiana the battle began at break of day by an artillery duel the federal battery being commanded by colonel charles carroll parsons and the confederates by captain william w carnes colonel parsons was a graduate of west point and captain carnes was a graduate of the naval academy at annapolis i took position upon an eminence at no great distance commanding a fine view of the engagement and there i watched the progress of the battle until duty called me elsewhere captain carnes managed his battery with the greatest skill killing and wounding nearly all the officers men and horses connected with parsons battery parsons fought with great bravery and coolness and continued fighting a single gun until the confederate infantry advanced the officer in command ordered colonel parsons to be shot down as the muskets were leveled at him he drew his sword and stood at parade rest ready to receive the fire the confederate colonel was so impressed with this display of calm courage that he ordered the guns lowered saying no you shall not shoot down such a brave man and colonel parsons was allowed to walk off the field subsequently i captured colonel parsons for the ministry of the church in the diocese of tennessee he was breveted for his bravery at perryville and he performed other feats of bravery in the war at murfreesboro he repelled six charges much of the time under musketry fire he was often mentioned in official reports of battles after the war he was on frontier duty until eighteen sixty eight when he returned to west point as a professor shortly after my consecration as bishop of tennessee i preached in the church of the holy trinity brooklyn new york on repentance and the divine life this sermon made a deep impression upon colonel parsons as he told me when i subsequently met him at a reception at the residence of the hon hamilton fish i visited him twice at west point by his invitation and a correspondence sprang up between us in eighteen seventy he resigned his commission in the army to enter the ministry he studied theology with me at memphis and it was my privilege to ordain him to the diaconate and advance him to the priesthood his first work was at memphis then for a while he was at cold spring new york he returned however to memphis and became rector of a parish of which mr jefferson davis was a member and a vestryman he remained heroically at his post of duty during the great epidemic of yellow fever in eighteen seventy eight he was stricken with the fever and died at my episcopal residence on the sixth of september captain carnes was the first man i confirmed after my consecration to the episcopate of tennessee with the advance of chetham's division the battle of perryville began in good earnest general chetham was supported by general claiborne and general bushrod johnson but it was not long before the whole confederate line from right to left was advancing steadily driving back the enemy it was a fierce struggle until nightfall the battle raged with unexampled fury a perfect hurricane of shell tore up the earth and scattered death on all sides while the storm of musketry mowed down the opposing ranks maney's brigade did the most brilliant fighting of the day it was in the charge by which the federal battery was captured that major-general jackson of the federal army was killed it was shortly after noon that the battle began with a sudden crash followed by a prolonged roar i was resting at the time in the woods discussing questions of theology with the rev dr joseph cross a wesleyan chaplain whom i had first met on the march into kentucky i sprang to my horse at once and said to him let us go there will be work enough for us presently he mounted his horse and followed me up a hill where we paused in full view of the enemy's line i dismounted and sat down in the shelter of a large tree saying as i did so you better get off your horse the enemy is training a battery this way and there will be a shell here in a short time scarcely were the warning words uttered than a shell struck the tree twenty feet above my head and a shower of wooden splinters fell about me 
i jumped into my saddle again and rode at full speed down the hill followed by my friend who shouted with laughter at what he called my resemblance to an enormous bird in flight with my long coat skirts like wings flying horizontal on the air when he overtook me at the creek i said to him this is the place you will remain with me and i shall give you something more serious to do than laughing at a flying buzzard dr cross assisted me that fearful day we met many times subsequently during the war and afterwards i ordained him deacon and priest and he was for a time on my staff of clergy in the diocese of tennessee when the wounded were brought to the rear at three o'clock in the afternoon i took my place as a surgeon on chaplain's creek and throughout the rest of the day and until half past five the next morning without food of any sort i was incessantly occupied with the wounded it was a horrible night i spent god save me from such another i suppose excitement kept me up about half past five in the morning of the ninth i dropped i could do no more i went out by myself and leaning against a fence i wept like a child and all that day i was so unnerved that if any one asked me about the regiment i could make no reply without tears having taken off my shirt to tear into strips to make bandages i took a severe cold the total loss of the confederates whose force numbered of all arms only sixteen thousand was five hundred and ten killed two thousand six hundred thirty five wounded and two hundred and fifty one captured or missing and of this loss a great part was sustained by our regiment how well i remember the wounded men one of the rock city guard brought to me mortally wounded cried out oh doctor i have been praying ever since i was shot that i might be brought to you one of the captains was wounded mortally it was thought at first but it was afterwards learned that the ball which struck him in the side instead of passing through his body had passed around under the integuments lieutenant woolridge had both eyes shot out and still lives a stripling of fifteen years fell in the battle apparently dead shot through the neck and collarbone but is still living lieutenant colonel patterson was killed at his side the latter was wounded in the arm early in the action he bound his handkerchief around his arm and in the most gallant and dashing style urged his men forward until a grape shot struck him in the face killing him instantly two days after the battle i went to the enemy's line with a flag of truce and the following day general polk who had won the hearts of the whole army asked me to go with him to the church in harrodsburg i obtained the key and as we entered the holy house i think that we both felt that we were in the presence of god general polk threw his arms about my neck and said oh for the blessed days when we walked in the house of god as friends let us have prayer i vested myself with surplice and stole and entered the sanctuary the general knelt at the altar railing i said the litany used proper prayers and supplications and then turned to the dear bishop and general and pronounced the benediction from the office for the visitation of the sick unto god's gracious mercy and protection i commit thee the lord bless thee and keep thee the lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee the lord lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace both now and evermore amen the bishop bowed his head upon the railing and wept like a child on its mother's breast shortly after this service general kirby smith begged me that he might go to the church with me so i returned and he too was refreshed at god's altar general kirby smith was a most remarkable character a few years later it was my pleasure to have him as one of my neighbors at sewanee tennessee where he did much towards making the university of the south what it is he was kindly big-hearted and no man was a better friend he was a very devoted communicant of the church and during the war whenever opportunity offered he held services and officiated as lay reader in an epidemic of cholera at nashville some years after the war he was called upon to say the burial office over his own rector who had died of the dread disease he entered upon his duties at the university of the south in eighteen seventy five as professor of mathematics and gave a great deal of attention to botany and natural science his end on the twenty eighth of march eighteen ninety three was very peaceful he died as he had lived 
bright strong in his christian faith and hope one of his last connected utterances was the fourth verse from the twenty-third psalm on good friday the thirty-first of march eighteen ninety three it was my high privilege to commit his body to the earth in the cemetery at sewanee end of chapter five Chapter 6 of Dr. Quintard, Chaplain C.S.A., and Second Bishop of Tennessee by Charles Todd Quintard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 Personal Narrative, Murfreesboro. After the Battle of Perryville, both Bragg and Kirby Smith were compelled to retreat by way of Cumberland Gap to Chattanooga. During this retreat, I was in charge of the regiment as surgeon, Dr. Buist having been left behind to care for our sick and wounded. Every morning I filled my canteen with whiskey and strapped it to the pommel of my saddle to help the wearied and broken down to keep up in the march. I was riding a splendid bay which had been brought from Maury County and presented to me by the members of the regiment. He was the best saddle horse I ever rode one day the colonel commanding the regiment rode up to me on his old gray nag and said doctor this horse of mine is very rough would you mind exchanging with me for a little while i was off my horse before he had finished speaking with a smiling countenance and a look of great gratitude he mounted my bay and rode off some hundred yards or more to the front accompanied by the lieutenant colonel the major and one or two other officers when they wheeled and saluted me the colonel holding aloft my canteen of whiskey and waving it with great glee each one taking a drink when that canteen was returned to me every drop of the whiskey had disappeared i was an innocent abroad from chattanooga i went to rome georgia to visit my family and to obtain some fresh clothing of which i was sorely in need there were many hospitals established there and among them was one named for me quintard hospital i spent much of my time in the hospitals and also went to columbus georgia to secure clothing for my regiment mr rhodes brown a president of one of the principal woolen mills in columbus gave me abundant supplies of the very best material besides this generous donation he gave me a thousand dollars to use as i saw fit after some weeks i rejoined the army which had moved on to murfreesboro on my way up i met at stevenson alabama captain jack butler of my regiment who informed me that a telegraphic dispatch from general polk had just passed over the line ordering me to murfreesboro i asked how he knew it and he told me that he had caught it as it clicked over the wire which seemed very wonderful to me then immediately on reaching murfreesboro i reported to general polk and said general i am here in response to your telegram he was greatly astonished and asked how it was possible for me to have made the journey from rome georgia in so brief a time general bragg who was in command at murfreesboro was attacked by rosecrans on the last day of the year eighteen sixty two a great battle resulted and the fighting continued until the second day of january eighteen sixty three i was on the field dressing the wounded as usual when an order came for me to repair to the hospitals while crossing the fields on my way to the hospitals in town a tremendous shell came flying toward me and i felt sure it would strike me in the epigastric region i leaned down over the pommel of my saddle and the shell passed far above my head as i rose to an upright position i found that my watchguard had been broken and that a gold cross which had been suspended from it was lost i never expected to see it again the next day a colonel moving with his command at double quick in line of battle picked up the cross and returned it to me the day following it is still in my possession a valued relic of the battle of murfreesboro as dr buist was still in perryville kentucky i was practically surgeon of the regiment as the wounded of the first tennessee were brought in they always called for me and it was my high privilege to attend nearly if not quite all the wounded of my regiment some of them were desperately wounded among these was bryant house nicknamed among the boys who were artists in bestowing nicknames shanty he had been shot through the body the surgeon into whose hands he had first fallen told him that it was impossible to extract the ball and that there was no hope for him 
well send for my chaplain he said doubtless thinking that i would offer up a prayer on his behalf instead of that however i went in search of the ball with my surgical instruments and was successful shanty died in september eighteen ninety five he was for years after the war a conductor on the nashville chattanooga and st louis railway and took great delight in telling this story i continued at work in the hospital located in south college until the army was about to fall back to shelbyville when i was sent for by general pope who asked if i would go to chattanooga in charge of willie huger whose leg had been amputated at the thigh he was placed in a box-car with a number of other wounded men and i held the stump of his thigh in my hands most of the journey when we reached chattanooga i was more exhausted than my patient i remained with him for some time the dear fellow finally recovered married a daughter of general polk and now resides in new orleans general james e raines a member of my parish in nashville fell while gallantly leading his men at the battle of murfreesboro general hanson of kentucky likewise gave up his life his last words were i am willing to die with such a wound in so glorious a cause here it was that colonel marks afterwards governor of tennessee was severely wounded and lamed for life after the first day's fight general bragg sent a telegram to richmond in the following words god has indeed granted us a happy new year but subsequently hearing that rosecrans was being heavily reinforced from nashville he retired to shelbyville carrying with him his prisoners and the spoils of battle for the confederates captured and carried off thirty cannon six thousand small arms and over six thousand prisoners including those captured by cavalry in the rear of the union army wheeler's cavalry also captured and burned eight hundred wagons End of chapter six